Okay, good afternoon, everyone. We're going to get started. Welcome. I am Mark Holiday, superintendent of the Brandywine School District, and we welcome you to Mount Pleasant High School, to our esteemed guests who are uh, participating in this town hall meeting. We welcome you and to the participants, the audience, and also guests, many of you, familiar faces. Welcome. We're happy to have you here. It's a fitting location for this town hall meeting. We are in a room that has been used for uh, many different events. This has traditionally been a tech ed workshop that has been transformed into a uh, state of the art STEM lab. And so what a great location and uh, space to use for a town hall meeting rather than an auditorium. Okay. Uh, before we, we actually introduce our guests or have them introduce themselves, uh, I want to point out that the, the Brandywine School District, when it applied for our, the Race to the Top grant and the SIG G grant, utilized those resources to not only support initiatives around STEM and AVID and college and career readiness, but a number of other programs, professional development opportunities, that led us to where we are here today. And the leader of the building during those four years, while he is no longer principal here, he's principal at another high school in the district, I think deserves recognition for the amazing leadership that he has provided this school over those four years, and that's Jim Simmons. Jim, thank you. And I want to make one impromptu announcement regarding a student achievement. We have a Mount Pleasant High School student here who will be representing the state of Delaware at the National Youth Science Camp this summer. He will develop his young scientist skills and it was based on a very competitive application process and we just found out about that this week. So congratulations to Evan McCoy. <laughs> So let's introduce our panelists here and begin to my left with the governor. Jack Markell. Jack Markell, governor of Delaware. Terry Quinn Graves, Delaware State Board of Education president. Arnie Duncan, thrilled to be here. Derek Hunter, Mount Pleasant High School. Brooks Twilley, engineering, Mount Pleasant High School. Ernie DeAnastasis uh, with CAI, IT company. <laughs> Mark Murphy, Delaware Secretary of Education. So we are joined by a diverse group of educators and leaders and student leaders, uh, teacher leaders, and so it's an opportunity for us as a community to engage with them around educational topics. And the, the protocol will work this way. We want to ask, have the opportunity to ask as many questions as possible in a short period of time. So we're going to ask the panelists, um, once a question is posed and you're the person answering it, you go ahead and answer that question. It doesn't necessarily have to be answered by every panelist. So I'll try to moderate this as best I can to keep it moving and flowing in an organized and efficient, effective manner. And I'll go ahead and ask the first question. So I'll pose it to anyone on the panel. Considering the last few, four years with Race to the Top, what is the single greatest accomplishment and what has been the greatest challenge, the one that may, might keep you up at night? Anyone? Oh, I'll go first. <laughs> um, I think our single greatest accomplishment has been the uh, persistence with Common Core. And I put that at the list because I think it's one of the most important of the initiatives that we have out there. Uh, we had a slow start with implementation and with uh, Secretary Murphy coming on in 2012, we had a re-energized effort to bring Common Core uh, back into an implementation mode. And I say that on behalf of the State Board's position that Common Core is about two things. It's about raising standards, and it's not about going over and beyond. It's raising the floor so that our students will have an opportunity to be prepared, not only for college, but for careers. So that is important. The other piece is about equity. 
It's about making sure that every student across the nation, and particularly Delaware, regardless of zip code, have access to high, rigorous standards. And so with that, I think that is one of the most important and uh, I would really say accomplishments to date that we have come through, and there's quite a bit more to do, but I would put that at the top of the list in terms of accomplishments. Secretary Duncan, you might want to build on that answer and give us a national perspective under the uh, Race to the Top uh, initiative nationally. What's the one thing you would point to that you, you would say as Secretary you're most proudest of? Well, what you guys have done here in Delaware I think is pretty extraordinary. And uh, I wish there was just one thing, but there are a couple things I'd like to say that you guys have done well. The focus on increasing access to early childhood education and not just access but high quality is a big, big deal. Seeing student achievement climb is obviously what this is all about. Um, seeing more freshmen on track is you know, a huge indicator. Um, seeing dropout rates cut in half, that's a big, big deal. The fact that you have, as a state, made a commitment to make sure every single low-income student who has done well has a chance to go to college and apply, you guys are leading the way there. And then we had a conversation earlier this morning with a set of teachers who are staying in tough communities. And I don't know of another state that's, that's done that. So people always look for a, sort of a simplistic answer. You guys are doing a number of things, cradle all the way through to career, that I think are hugely important. And this is not declaring victory. There's a long way to go, much unfinished business. But I couldn't be more proud of the collective leadership here. The biggest challenge for me, for the state, is to stay the course, is implementation. And there will be bumps, there will be rough patches, things won't always go perfectly, and there'll be lots of pressure to sort of go back to the old way, to dummy things down, to slow down the rate of progress. And the next couple years, if you can stay the course, do it in a very humble way, continue to listen to make mid-course corrections, the other side of this, I think, is going to be just extraordinary. Thank you. Let's open it up to questions. Raise your hand if you have a question. Not all at one time. <laughs> Come on, someone get it started. Question from the audience. Ms. Siskin. Um, and this maybe goes to Ernie as well as to Secretary Murphy. Um, one of the biggest things that I think the schools have to catch up on is technology. I'm sorry. Uh, the schools are way behind the kids. We're way behind the, the progress that technology is making. I know we have a proposal out there to try to get greater technology and quicker into the schools and getting our teachers up to speed. But what sort of national and private sector support can we get for that? Well, I think the technology piece is absolutely an essential building block for where we're headed. And as an IT employer, uh, I can tell you, I, I got here a little early, I got a great tour from Brian Shirk of the uh, STEM lab, and it's, a, it's very impressive. And this, this is just a wonderful undertaking that's gonna help a lot. Uh, one of the things that, it, it, from our perspective, it's, it's a game changer. As we're looking for potential employees, uh, having great capability with technology is going to be absolutely a, a critical piece. And I think the hardest thing is, is, is uh, everybody has to step up and we have to work in partnership. The private sector can really help in this regard and I think the, the opportunity is there to build deep and meaningful partnerships with the schools with technology being an important component of that. I think to echo off of what Ernie said, I think in this room, in this district, um, in the state, we're on that leading edge of implementing a variety of instructional technologies. And I think in the past, uh, technology's not been treated, it's growing. And I think um, in the past, we treated it as a novelty, and now it's in ingrained in every aspect of our lives. And if education's not realizing that and adopting it at the same rate that industry and the rest of the world is, I think we're, we're going to set ourselves up to be behind. Just, just to build on that, we are sitting in a school and in a district that is doing some cutting edge work in related, in related to technology through the brink, right? The, the consortium of districts working on a personalized learning agenda and, and utilizing technology as part of that agenda. I think what is critical for me to build off of, of those types of efforts is to be able to provide the types of resources and support <coughs> at the state level. Right? And we saw support from our legislature last year for an additional infusing of, of dollars into our districts related to technology. So 
Those dollars are arriving now to, to build more infrastructure, to have the actual devices. But even more importantly going forward, I think it's critical that we actually learn what's working about this technology, that it's not about putting an iPad in a kid's hands, right? It is about an, an effective and a smart use of that technology to drive a personalized agenda. And by that, I mean that the instruction matches where the child's needs are. And technology can be a great tool to do that. If I could make a, um, a, a broader point than just the technology in the classroom, and it's really about giving more students the opportunity to understand what careers around science and technology and engineering and math uh, are all about. And so this is a reason a few years ago we created our STEM council. And you know, a couple weeks ago we were do down at Dover High School where we celebrated Ashland, a local employer, you know, uh, putting up some money to recognize great STEM teaching uh, across the state. But the, the, the real issue for us is to make sure that more and more students understand how what they're learning in school is connected to what they're going to do for the rest of their lives. And I remember I visited, actually it was at Mount Pleasant, it was probably about eight or nine years ago, and I talked to a few teachers who were uh, dealing, we were talking about the students who drop out. And they, they basically said, you know, so many of the students who choose not to uh, continue with their schooling, they don't drop out because they're not intelligent. In fact, many of them are very intelligent, but they, so many of them don't understand how what they're learning is at all connected with what they're going to do later in their lives. And so I'm incredibly appreciative of the partnerships that are developing across the state between our higher ed system and businesses, between our businesses in K-12, and between higher ed and K-12. And you're, you're really fortunate in this district, you have Judd Wagner as your STEM coordinator, who is also the co-chair with Terry Quinn Gray uh, of, the, of the overall STEM council. And I think we're just going to do a better and better job of making sure that more of our students have an opportunity to understand how technology, how what they're learning is related. One, one last point, because it, it also stems from this district. About two years ago, I visited PS, and is it Mr. Singer? Is that the? Uh, John Singer. Yeah, where, where is he? Yeah, you know, I tell you, my, my visit to your classroom, I talk about it all over the state, and because, you know, you, you demonstrated, and this is, is probably more like three or four years ago, because you were demonstrating to these kids, they were working in the class, I think it was like on trigonometry or something, and I mean, at a very young age, and then you took them out and back of the school where they were launching rockets. And I think you managed to bring together the, the classroom learning with this hands-on learning in a way that I think, you know, the, the more that that happens around the state, I think the better off our students will be. Thank you, Governor. Next question. Raise of hand, please. Do I see a question? Oh. Mr. Scrobot, Board President. Uh, good afternoon. I'm John Scrobot, uh, President of the Board. Um, I'm very proud of our school district, our, our our superintendent and his executive team and what they've done, all our buildings and uh, the accomplishments that they've made. Um, I'm, I find that uh, with with uh, the new regulations, federal state regulations, our um, our district office is um, had to put a lot of effort and time um, to um, satisfy th these regulations, and 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 they're all good. I'm, I'm not saying that they're not. But it seems like in today's world, we need to have a dual staff in our office, one to deal with the regulations and uh, initiatives that come from the state and, and local levels um, to advance, you know, uh, our students' education. But we also need a, a second tier in our district office to be at the buildings and, and assist the, the buildings in um, preparing our children and, and, and raising the bar and doing things better. They're, they're doing it here at the local, you know, at, at the buildings, but when we have to have cuts, of course, we don't want to affect the buildings. We don't want to cut teachers, so we cut at our, our district office level, and it, and it does put a big burden on them. Is, is there any, any suggestions or any programs that we might not be aware of that you could um, uh, steer us towards to, to help in that area? Well, let me answer the question differently. I mean, I think the real focus ought to be, and, you know, we've, uh, Secretary Murphy and the team at the Department of Education have really tried to focus on being, uh, you know, more supporting educational excellence as opposed to being, you know, compliance driven. And, we, you know, we had an exercise last year throughout state government. We actually had all of our agencies that have any regulations at all. We had a public hearing in each of our three counties. 
uh, and invited members of the public in, business folks, people in education, to identify for us regulations that are just not working. And so if there are specific regulations that you think are just uh, more about filling out paperwork and are not supportive of the education that's taking place every day uh, in our schools, we certainly want to know about it. I would just echo that at the federal level, that you said they're all good. I'm sure they're all not good. I think you'd be a little generous there. And if things make sense, we should keep doing them. If things don't make sense, we should stop. I think all I care about, the superintendent, the governor, is having more students be successful. And if we're helping you do that, then we're doing our job. If we're getting in the way of that with short resources, with inadequate staff, with, in, with inadequate dollars, then we're part of the problem. So I just challenge folks to be very, very clear and upfront with us where we are part of the solution and when we're getting in the way. When we're getting in the way, challenge us to do it. Finally, I'll just say we're going to, as we move forward, try and behave in a very different way and set up in our office, not the Title I office and the Title II office, and that our bureaucracy then mirrors your bureaucracy, to start to move to a state debt system. So we can just partner directly with states, combine all these resources, hold you accountable to high bar, but give you a lot more room to move. So this is a, a pretty radical internal change, um, but it's absolutely the right thing to do. And frankly, we're late getting there. We should have done it a couple of years ago. Thank you. Question, Mr. Brumsko. Mine isn't a question, but mine is. And let me get some questions from the kids in a minute, from the students. Okay, so the last adult questions coming to you guys. <laughs> is a point of view from the member of the board of the Brandywine School District, who is also the president of the Delaware State Boards Association. I'm hearing all across the state this one big concern. You're giving us mandates, but you're not giving us the funding to support them. And that's a growing concern from every district. I don't expect an answer today, but I just wanted to register with you. That's something that I'm concerned about, as well as the other 19 districts in the state. Thank you, Mr. Brumskill. Students, this is an opportunity to ask a, a question. Who would like to ask one? Yes, sir, please stand, uh, say your name, and deliver the question. Um, I'm Chris Johnson. I've just got a question for all of you. Um, over the next few years in the Brandy One School District, what sort of changes could we see happening for us as students? Is, yeah. <laughs> Do, I, I'm supposed to be the moderator, but I would like to answer that question. <laughs> so, Pre K through 12, there are a number of initiatives that we have in place right now that we are looking to expand upon. One of which, of course, sitting in the STEM lab is in fact STEM. So we have three amazing STEM teachers from each of our three high schools represented today. And we have students from Concord, Mount, and Brandywine joining us today. So hopefully after this question is answered in short, by the way, we'll hear some more really uh, interesting questions coming from the students. But I think we have an opportunity right now, not only in Brandywine, but across the state, to really leverage the work that we've been doing over the last four years and build upon it. So the three STEM teachers, as an example, we were talking before this event began. And what a great opportunity with the three of them to build a teacher career ladder, uh, ladder. maybe pilot some work with them, because we know that it's really difficult to attract people out of those fields in education right now. So I'm hoping that's one of the questions we get to today with the panel. How do we attract STEM teachers, quality dedicated STEM teachers into the field? And so I think if we look internally at what we can do to build a teacher career ladder that gives classroom practitioners opportunities outside of the classroom without becoming an assistant principal dealing with discipline, I think it's a real attractive approach. So that's one example. Another example I would uh, point to are things that we're, we're doing, and it was mentioned earlier, that are just different than elsewhere. That is with this blending and uh, learning initiative. I believe our young learners, more than ever, starting in kindergarten, are utilizing technology in their home differently than they've ever been in the past. And when they come into a classroom, they need to be engaged, stimulated, and we have to be receptive to the fact that you, young people, are learning differently than we were when we were in a classroom. So we need to change or we need to shift. We need to be open-minded and shift from a teacher-centered classroom to a student-centered classroom. And I think blended learning is going to help get us there. Thank you. Other questions by students? Yes, sir. Oh, um this is uh, mostly a question for Secretary Duncan, although I suppose pro probably the Governor and Secretary Murphy could answer it as well. And um, 
First of all, I would like to congratulate you on being the MVP of the NBA All-Star <laughs> <laughs> Celebrity Game. But, um, I carry my trophy with me. <laughs> I, um, I'm just wondering, um, you know, here at, the, here at Mount, we have the IB program, and you know, also here in Wilmington, we have Charter. And I, and I was just wondering if you favored the creation of more th programs and schools where you like, concentrated you know, like, highly motivated students. And if so, like, are, are you implementing any programs to create or support them? It's a great question. So I'm a huge fan of the IB program. And what's interesting to me for the I, about the IB program is not just for the high flyers, it's for the hard workers. And you can be very smart, but if you don't work hard, you are not going to make it in the IB curriculum. I guess you, you can attest to that. And uh, providing those kinds of chances where you can not just go to college in this country, but go to college anywhere in the world, if you're interested in doing that, I think is a, is a life transforming opportunity. So whether it's um, the IB program, we just met with a bunch of students in the AVID program. I'm a huge fan of the AVID program. Again, that's not all the high flyers. That's young people, many first generation college goers, supporting each other to go the right way. AP classes, because you were AP class earlier, getting college credit, dual enrollment programs where you're actually on college campuses, taking college classes for credit. The more we create those kinds of opportunities, the better you're going to do. And I'm just, I absolutely believe what the governor said. Most young people who drop out of high school drop out not because it's too hard, but because it's too easy. They're not engaged. And the more we raise the bar for you, the more we increase opportunities, the better you're going to do. So there's no one right or wrong answer, but if we have lots of different high quality options, you guys will figure out what the right path is for you. Thank you. Other student, Jordan Siskin, please stand. <laughs> um. So earlier we talked about the potential of the private sector in terms of technology, but I think there's a lot more potential in the private sector in terms of like career readiness and things like that. Are we doing anything to tap into that? Uh, the, absolutely. In fact, just uh, yesterday um, I got to address our State Chamber of Commerce. I see Rich Heffron, who's the head of the Ch uh, State Chamber of Commerce, is here and talked to 260 business people about the really extraordinary partnerships that are developing amongst a number of private sector companies in Delaware and the opportunities that they're providing uh, to students, and to, you know, including high school uh, you know, juniors and seniors across a range of fields. We're really primarily focused around um, uh, the manufacturing uh, fields, but not, not exclusively limited to manufacturing, but we've got some great partnerships uh, that are developing there. And, and again, it gets back to this point, the more, s the, the model, the country that is generally held up as doing the best in this area is Germany. And they do a great job of providing these apprenticeship opportunities for teenagers to get into places of work, to learn what it's all about, and to be developing the skills that they need to then you know, go into the workplace. There have been a number of places in this country which are trying to do the same thing. And just within the last three or four months, there were front page articles in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal about a couple of programs that are trying to do the same thing. And what really struck me when I read them is that one program had like six participants and then the other program had like seven participants. Nobody's really, and, 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 but, but it was a big deal because it's a new way of thinking and nobody has really done this at scale, you know, at size. And I think one of the opportunities that we always talk about in Delaware and I think we really make it real is the fact that we can, we connect with each other in, in, a, in a room much smaller than this one, much smaller than this one. We can get, you know, the key people around the table to make commitments to each other and so we have, the, the Delaware Manufacturing Ex, uh, Association and the Manufacturing Extension Partnership, a number of their members have already committed to us to provide these opportunities, but we have to make a commitment back to them that we're going to provide kids in the classroom with the kind of tra you know, academic uh, preparation as well as some of the uh, softer skills development that will be required in the workplace. But I'm really excited about it because the fact, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you know, four-year college is not for everybody, two years not for everybody. Everybody is going to have to continue on with their education when they get out of high school, and we think these are great opportunities to pursue that. Thank you. Another student question. Yes. Um, that's okay. Do I need a microphone? Hi, guys. Hi. Um, I'm Sydney Nye, so you probably already recognized me from the previous meeting, and I'm a senior here at Mount Pleasant High School. Um, I am very much interested in chemical engineering, and in being so, I realize that I'm really very much a minority among first-generation college students, and even, oh, sorry, 
and even within my gender. So what is being done at a national level, a state level, and a district level to bridge the gap between the interests of men and women in science and math related fields? Sydney, thank you for that question. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, so first of all, let me start with our conversation in Delaware. Oh, oh yes, I am a chemist, actually a, a nuclear analytical chemist. Uh, and I haven't been in, yes, we should get together. Uh, and um, I have had one of the most remarkable careers and it has not been without its challenges being a female in the field. So let me talk about a little bit about the Delaware STEM Council and our conversation right now. We have an emphasis on not only encouraging our young people to go into STEM careers, but particularly women in underrepresented groups. And the conversation has a couple uh, uh, parallels there. One is we want to talk directly to you, and that's you men, women of all persuasions, about what amazing opportunities come with a STEM career or just STEM readiness and STEM preparation. And what that means is that you will be equipped with everything from analytical reasoning skills to uh, communication skills to computational skills to problem solving skills. And that doesn't sound like necessarily an analytical nuclear chemist. All of us do that. And what that does though, it opens up uh, opportunities for you to exist in research areas, in legal areas, in entrepreneur, uh, actually what I call educators, academicians, all of that is available to you with a STEM background. So let me just say that. So what are we doing? We have a women minorities uh, group committee within the STEM Council that is actually planning outreach both in all communities about what does it mean to have access to each other, about what it means to survive not only in the classroom but in the boardroom as well as on the playground because it does matter. And, um, and that gives you access to mentors and people around the state as well as around the country. So that's the, the, what I would call the local conversation. But all of us in Delaware who are involved in the STEM areas, particularly professionally, have extensive national and international networks that we plan to bring to the state. And so we've talked about, for instance, uh, with the National Science Foundation and with the American Chemical Society about how do we bring a program like Women Chemists of Color which means all of us can carry that, you know, to the state. This is a national program that has searched and uh, across the country professional women. And what are they doing? Everything, again, from entrepreneurs to educators to stay-at-home moms to teachers, the whole gamut, and what, it, what that power brings to our nation economically as well as what it brings to our families and our communities. So just as an example. So watch out and we make sure we exchange cards before we leave. <laughs> yes. Okay, question in the back. Yes, sir. What type of advice would you give a person, a student who has like the mindset of a business, what type of advice would you give a, a person, a teenager, a student who has the mindset of a business person who wants to change this perspective, this perspective, I can't think of the word, <laughs> perspective of education for youth and stuff like that. Um, basically, I believe in the STEM program. Uh, I want to take it to the next level. I want to start it earlier like you guys want to do. But what type of advice would you give me so that I can stay along that path and like have to have that courage and that, um, I guess, that sense of comfort? I know what I really want to do. Secretary Duncan, do you want I, I, to start? I will start. I would strongly encourage you to come teach when you're done. <laughs> and the whole STEM area where so many of the jobs are future going to be, so many young people start to turn off of the STEM areas in third and fourth and fifth grade because they don't have teachers who are comfortable and confident with that content. And we need more teachers who are working hard to recruit 100,000 teachers nationally to come in and help us in the STEM fields so we can produce the next generation. So folks like you who want to come back, more men, more men of color, we have desperate needs there. And we're going to have about a million teachers retire over the next four to six years, a baby boomer generation. So even in tough economic times, we're going to hire across the country 100,000 to 200,000 teachers each year. We have a website, teach.org. Go check it out. And I uh, would love to see you come back in and help. But whatever your future dreams are, just keep working really, really hard. Get the best grades you can. And think about the summer internships, the career, the opportunities after school to pursue those dreams. Anyone else want to comment? I think that's actually pretty admirable that being a young person, you're interested in, in giving back and sharing your excitement with the STEM fields. Uh, our district has, is in the works um, trying to just 
expand our capacity with STEM and reach more people than we can just in the classroom. Uh, we started that with after school engineering clubs and we're trying to, to push that down through the middle schools and in elementary and I think one of the exciting ways that you could get involved now is, is reach out to maybe the middle school you're closest to or your feeder pattern and see what engineering programs are available after school. You might you know, rub shoulders with some, some sixth graders and help them put some stuff together help start something up at the elementary school maybe your little brother or sister goes to. Um, we're looking also to expand within facilities like this at our three high schools, weekend workshops to bring you and your little brother or sister, your mom and dad in and work together and, and problem solve and get back to that, that mentality. I'd like to highlight two very concrete things. The first is that every year you high school students bring home some sort of catalog that talks about the courses that you can take next year. And every year across our state, our, we are seeing our high schools offer more and more AP classes, more dual enrollment classes, more distance learning classes, the types of opportunities that can feed into to what the question is asking. And so number one, you have to take advantage of those opportunities. You've got to sign up for those classes. Right? That's first. And second is grab your closest friend and get them to sign up too. Right? Especially the kid who wasn't necessarily thinking about it and isn't totally motivated. Because maybe if they take that class in their junior year, then all of a sudden they'll be excited about it. And to take it one step further, even if your school doesn't offer all of the things that you want it to do in, in computer science or in engineering, then right now you have access to so much more than all of us up here had. Right? And you have those, these things called MOOCs, Massive Online Open Courses, and you can take coding classes, and you can take engineering classes, and you can take them from Stanford, or you can take them from Yale. And those are all available to you right now. So my strongest advice is, number one, don't pass up the opportunity to take these rigorous courses. And number two, grab a friend and convince them to do it too. And Mark, how much do those, co those courses cost? They're absolutely free. free. <laughs> so can I just put in one last plug, because this is so encouraging. Check out www.delawarestem.org to find out uh, all the businesses as well as academic institutions and partners we have that would love to actually share what's going on and, ha and invite you to join in what is actually it means, right, to be a practicing professional you know, in the STEM area. STEM is all about a aggregate of careers and disciplines, so it's so varied, but it's a practice sport. So get in there and figure out what we do day to day, ask lots of questions and stop by, DelawareSTEM.org. Thank you, Dr. Gray. So everyone on the uh, panel has spoken, except for our student, and that's Derek Hunter. Okay. Derek, STEM uh, is, is something that's near and dear to you. You've had a lot of success within the program. Derek's in 11th grade. If there was one thing that you could point to, to your fellow classmates that has really been, uh, has provided impact for you within the STEM area, whether it's extracurricular uh, programming, whether it's an assignment project or a person, can you just detail that for us? Uh, I would say the Code Academy on that computer over there, it helps. <laughs> Uh, once you know that, you can build your own website, and that's the first tip to entrepreneurship. And when you can, uh, entrepreneurs is uh, a great way to get into careers. So uh, it can, it, it gives you details, and it's free. It's an online course, and it tells you, uh, and it's all about technology. Once you code, once you uh, plug in like different functions and codes, you can uh, create anything you want on the source. Thank you, Derek. Okay, I'm going to pause for just a moment because we have a group of students that um, are joining us who are going to have to leave for dismissal in just a minute or so. So if you are one of those students, this would be an opportune time for you to go ahead and um, head out of the room so that you can catch your bus. Is there any student who is in that category? Just a couple? You have to leave at 2.10. Go ahead and leave now. Yep. And thank you for your participation. Have a great afternoon. Okay, another question, please. Yes, sir. Has the Bright School District considered changing the start times for the different, like for the elementary, middle school, and high school levels? So, great question, and it's a timely one because one of my friends, who's also a district parent, sent me an article. He's a librarian up in up in uh, Philadelphia at one of the colleges, and he sent me a great article around uh, a study that was done saying we should start high schools later. Um, it is something that we have had some uh, preliminary conversations about at the board level, but there are a number of challenges around starting high school late. It has to do with extracurricular activities and such, bus runs and brandywine. 
Each district's a little bit different. In Brandywine, we actually have three bus runs. We start with our high school, then we go to middle, and then we go to elementary. And even though research tells us we should start with elementary students, I suspect if you ask those elementary children and their families, they won't be so keen on starting at 7.30 <laughs> in the morning. So it's not one I have an answer to today, but I will tell you it's a conversation that we have been having here in Brandywine, and I suspect there are some other superintendents in the room. That is a conversation that happens throughout the state. I don't know when a change will come or whether uh, it's something that the state is interested in, in engaging in, but it's something we discuss. Good question. Other questions? Yes, sir, in the blue, STEM. <laughs> I work with computer programming a lot because it's something that I enjoy doing. And I've noticed there's a serious lack of actual computer programming and computer science courses in the state of Delaware. I've actually talked to Judd Wagner at some length about this last year about... <laughs> I don't know where he went. He was <laughs> He's um, sinking down in his, in his chair right now. <laughs> and we actually talked about how few kids actually went into those pro programs and came out of them with a passing grade. Uh, just, I'll take that one. And we've got an exciting answer for you, Alex. Um, just <laughs> in the past two weeks, uh, Brandywine, Concord, and Mount Pleasant High School have signed on with a partnership with the University of Delaware, the National Science Foundation, to pilot the first computer science principles course starting next academic year. I think uh, to tag on to what Secretary Murphy started to say with these MOOCs, these free online courses, and what Derek tapped into is one of the most influential things so far in his young learning career. That's Code Academy, and that, he spoke of HTML. We had students in the back today, currently right now, programming with JavaScript. You want to learn anything. The landscape for learning has changed. You're going to see changes. This is exploding now at the high school level, and you, you're going to see changes that you can access from your phones, from your tablets, from anywhere. Um, take advantage of that. I mean, we've, got, we've got students of all walks and just different perspectives in life and these types of skills and, and the different varieties and how you learn them and access and apply them I think it's really become personalized learning and free and accessible and free is the, the key word and it's it's flexible enough you could you could do it on your iPad your Android phone your mom's laptop so the resources are out there not only is business bought into this higher ed's bought into this um, tap into it. Thank you, Mr. Twilley. We have time for one more question. Mr. Singer, go ahead. You've been waiting patiently. Go ahead. I don't need it. Can I ask a question that's going to spin off of something that he said, and he said it's going to be directed towards you, Mr. Secretary. Not you, sorry. <laughs> Quite happy. Quite happy. In, in Delaware, we have been working with STEM, and we have been battling against silence. They we're always hearing science. We're not hearing math that much, but there's technology and engineering in the middle of it. And from my standpoint, as a teacher wanting to learn new things, I don't see the Department of Education really driving the bus on professional development that technology and engineering teachers can use. What can you do about it? What is the department doing about it? And I would be willing to help if you would like help. <laughs> May take you up on that, Mr. Singer. Uh, so I think th this is fitting for a last question because it's a push. It's a, pu it's a push to say that we have focused tremendously on, on some key priorities in recent years. Right? And, and while we talk about the STEM Council and we talk about the STEM careers and, and engagement with our corporations and partners, I, Mr. Singer, I think you're raising a really valid point. And so the question becomes for me, it's, it's that within a world of, of limited resources and where we need to prioritize what is the best thing that I can do to help you in, in terms of the state level and at my department. And, and I think that there's a couple of answers to that. And the first answer is that sometimes the, the state and just needs to get out of the way. 
right? and, and allow things to happen. Um, and, and part of getting out of the way is clearing off some regulations or something like that. But the other part of getting out of the way is allowing our districts and schools to drive their own innovative practices. Um, and so some of you in here know that last year we repurposed one and a half million dollars and we funded 14 innovation grants that came from schools, from classrooms, from districts um, all across the state. Right? And that is something that we hadn't done before. We had 74 applications. We anticipated 20. We got 74 because it was for things like this. How do we make this more meaningful? So part of it is clearing off regulations, getting out of the way. The second part is investing in innovative practices that we think will yield results. Right? And third is that we start thinking about adult learning in a different kind of way that it does not need to happen during the six and a half hour school day. And it does not need to happen by paying for specific courses. You know, as we have heard multiple times in the last half an hour, there is so much available to learn from now. And so this is really about how do we set up our structures or challenge our structures uh, to allow this adult learning to happen in new and innovative ways. So part of me would be looking to you to define how do we best do this um, in this current construct we have. Thank you. I think to add to that, um, and Ernie maybe can add to this. I think we've talked about engaging students with the careers and, the, and the, the, the world that they're going out into. And as teachers, we sort of, that growth has stopped after our education and maybe the one or two professional developments that we hit a year. I think if, if this is going to be meaningful change, we need to have articulation with industry and higher education to make sure that we're on the cutting edge and that our kids aren't coming out of the pipeline not ready for business and that maybe we're five years behind, that's still behind, that's not good enough in today's day and age. Can I, I, I will add one thing. Uh, the, it's really important not to get hung up on the exact discipline. What an employer really looks for and thinks about is you know, aptitude, work ethic, leadership, and passion, and, and that you're really pursuing something you enjoy a lot of the training and support will also come from, from the private sector as you engage in the, right, in the right path, but its key is to align it. So in other words, think about, think about those life skills at the same time you're working on your academic skills. Those are absolutely critical, and I think that's another way that the private sector can really be helpful through meaningful partnerships is around support and help uh, with some of those disciplines and skills as well to complement the great STEM education you're going to get through a lab like this and a school like this. So thank you. And our time has come. We must conclude our town hall meeting. This could go on and on for hours, I'm sure, with the uh, number of educators in the room and such. We must wrap it up, Mr. Brumskill. Yeah, I'm going to wrap it up. <laughs> we need steam. <laughs> uh, let's get the arts in the program. Mr. Brumskill feels strongly that STEM should include the arts, as do we. So thank you, Mr. Brumskill, and being that he is the most senior board member, we always give him the last word in the Brandywine School District. He was also, of course, on the board when the superintendent here was hired, so we always give him the last word. To our audience, we, we thank you for your participation and engagement, and of course, to our guests, panelists, uh, thank you very much for being so honest and forthright in your answers. Let's give them a round of applause.